code on GitHub. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Zebrium to, uh, uh, before, before I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a uh, question that came up in a recent talk that I was delivering on Litmus. And that was, well, the results said pass from Litmus and how do I, but the application didn't keep working while the pod was killed off. So how do we know what happens in the application? Um, well, the answer is that you have to use some mechanism to inspect the logs that your application is generating when the chaos happens. And so you've got all the time correlated event logs streaming in through your logging facilities in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, but Zebrium is going to tell us how we can find correlations in those and relate the events back to the original source, uh, relate log information back to the original source event. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so let me just share my screen. If you can just stop sharing, thank you. Cool, so um, I'm David Gilder from uh, Zebrium, and um, basically I'm gonna talk about exactly how we solved the problem that Brian just uh, mentioned. So um, we basically, before we kind of get started, just to kind of set the context, I'll tell you a little bit about what we are and what we mean by autonomous monitoring, and, um, and just tell you how we kind of built this tool around Litmus Chaos for um, users that wanna kind of try out Zebrium uh, to test um, really easily. So to get started, you know, what is Zebrium? So we essentially use machine learning to detect incidents in your, um, in your infrastructure and uh, applications uh, from logs and in future metrics uh, without any configuration. So that means you don't have to set up any alert rules or tell us anything else about your environment. We basically will find incidents uh, completely unsupervised. And, um, and the reason we kind of focus on this problem is because if you kind of look at the monitoring space today, uh, particularly in log monitoring, um, you know, there's a lot of manual work involved to kind of monitor your environment. Like, I think the real reason is, is because today our monitoring tools are very dumb and you kind of have to tell them what to look for. And if you don't tell them what to look for, they're not going to alert you or tell you uh, what's going wrong in your environment. So if you look at the typical workflow of um, a developer or operations person uh, kind of using log monitoring, you know, there's a bunch of work involved to kind of set up the agents and build parsers to kind of extract meaning out of those um, log events. Um, you have to kind of configure all the alert rules. You have to tell the monitoring system what to look at and keep an eye on um, um, to be alerted on, um, which, which can, in some complex environments, grow to hundreds or thousands of alert rules for some environments. Um, the only real automation you get from monitoring nowadays is you pretty much get alerted when there's an incident detected uh, from your alert rules. And then that still requires you to go in and manually start searching for logs and root cause uh, for gigabytes or uh, terabytes of logs. And, um, and then finally, you find the root cause, you can then manually go and resolve the incident. And then you're back into the workflow of tuning your alerts, maybe building some more dashboards um, in order for you to kind of catch that, um, that issue again in future. So there's a lot of manual steps in there. And really what that leads to is a real productivity drain for your team. Um, alert fatigue because you're constantly having to maintain and uh, tune these alerts and um, um, as your environment kind of changes to keep the noise down and ultimately the biggest impact is that slow mean time to resolution so you know your service goes down if your team's having to manually search through lots of logs uh, to find out what's going on you know there's there's a time delay there and your users are being impacted uh, throughout that incident. Um, and one of the reasons why this is very timely um, is because you know, we are moving far more into kind of cloud native architectures running on cloud and microservices um, and distributed systems um, like the one shown here. And that just makes it exponentially harder to, um, to kind of find out what's going in your environment. You know, there's far more logs and metrics and data coming out of that environment when you're monitoring it. And, um, and there's far more things changing all the time as different teams push different microservices out uh, with deployments. And, um, and that basically means that there's a lot more work now to keep your alert rules up to date and keep your dashboards up to date to make sure that you're not tripping over and missing things um, um, when they go wrong as your environment kind of continuously changes. So what we're basically doing at uh, Zebrium is we're basically building the world's first and most advanced autonomous monitoring system, focusing on logs first because they generally tend to be the hardest thing to kind of 
uh, make sense of um, with the amount of data they generate and also because they tend to have the source of truth that you want to look at when you're in an incident. So as you can see, we've kind of taken that very manual, slow kind of uh, process uh, workflow for, for monitoring right now and really just simplified it down with machine learning. So the only thing you really need to do is set up the agents, which you can deploy into Kubernetes with a couple of commands and it takes about five minutes. Um, and that will start collecting your logs and coming soon uh, metrics and maybe in the future traces. Um, and literally just send that data to Zebrum. And Zebrum starts using its machine learning to automatically figure out what your environment does, um, what looks like normal in your environment, um, spot anomalies for every single a log or metric that comes into into into, into Zebram, uh, which is a very hard problem to do at scale, as you can probably imagine. Um, and then look at patterns across those anomalies to essentially detect, ah, oh, there's something wrong going on here. It's a, it's an incident. Let's automatically alert someone um, that they need to look at something. And because we can see what's going on during that incident across all the logs and, and metrics, uh, we can basically take that user when they click on that alert to a, a root cause and, um, and show them all the information that we've kept collected for that incident. So all of a sudden you're orientated very quickly into kind of seeing what's going on, all again using machine learning. And so really the only manual step after that is, okay, I've seen there's something going wrong. Now I can see the root cause. I can see what the symptoms are. Let's resolve the incident. Um, and what that basically leads to is, first of all, just, you know, there's, you don't have to basically continuously uh, manage these, um, you know, these massive lists of alert rules and keep them up to date as your environment changes. Um, you're automatically taken to the root cause, so it saves you a hell of a lot of time having to sift through gigabytes or terabytes of logs, uh, which ultimately results in the core benefit of faster time, to, uh, mean time to resolution. So, if you basically had all that information given to you within minutes of an incident occurring um, or seconds. Um, you know, you can pretty much go straight to resolving the incident before, well, uh, before users are severely impacted. Um, and really, at the core of it, it is basically built on machine learning, and we have a white paper that talks about how this happens. I won't go into the details of it, we've got a lot of blogs and talks and um, the white paper to kind of go into how our machine learning works, but I can answer questions at the end. Um, but essentially, what the machine learning really does is looks at all your log streams, looks at all your metrics, and basically automatically detects incidents uh, without having to, to tell the monitoring system anything, because that's completely unsupervised. And then the other thing it does is when it detects an incident, tries to figure out what the root cause is, so you don't have to go sifting through those logs and searching to find, um, to find what the root cause is, saving you a lot of time. And, you know, I said I wouldn't go into too much detail on the, the way it works, but really, you know, this um, kind of just shows at a very high level, like how Zebrum works, and this is actually from the um, uh, Zebrum UI. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're, we're running anomaly detection on every single log stream, every single metric that comes into to Zebrum from our collectors. And, um, and so that creates a stream of anomaly, anomalies, as you can see here. And what we're basically looking at a high level is for patterns in those anomalies. So if we see like a cluster of anomalies suddenly appear um, with some exceptions and errors that, you know, um, that look anomalous and look like um, a real problem in your environment, we'll basically bundle those all up into an incident and basically figure out what the root cause is uh, from, from those bundle of anomalies. Um, so you'll only get alerted once, you won't get alerted for all of these different anomalies because if you look at any data in the monitoring space, it's very noisy. You don't really want to be alerted at that level. You want to be alerted when actually something happens, a, a change of pattern in your environment. And that's what this is showing here in the UI. Um, and to kind of give you examples of use cases, I mean, it's basically at the core of it, essentially detecting anomalies across everything. So anything that, you know, is anomalous in your logs or, or, or metrics, um, if there's an incident that's detected in them, you know, we will alert you to them. So there really is a really, really broad range of use cases. But you know the kind of flagship numbers that everyone asked at the moment, we can detect um, over sixty percent of real incidents happening in your environment, uh, completely unsupervised. So again, you just send us your logs and metrics, and with sixty uh, percent of the time, we will basically hit um, a real incident that we'll alert you to, and we will basically um, also correlate that to the root cause. Um, and um, we expect that to get to about 80% or above uh, with the metrics integrations that we're doing um, coming soon. Um, and, and one thing to kind of note on this that isn't talked about, but people always ask is, you know, how, how much noise is, is, is there in that? Like, are, are you getting lots of incidents created every day? Well, 
um, from what we've been seeing with all our kind of early users, um, um, we've actually got a very low noise uh, to signal ratio. So um, yes, you'll, you'll find 60% of your incidents or 60 to 80% of your incidents uh, completely unsupervised, but you're not gonna get another 100 incidents created um, with false positives for every incident that we do find. So generally we're seeing about two or three real incidents um, created a day in Zebrium, even for large clusters. Um, and and um, most of those are real incidents that the users care about. So, you know, it's, as you can imagine, the kind of incidents we can track then if we can do it um, anomaly detection across all of these different things um, is application incidents. So, you know, in this example here on the left, a database went down, we caught that and, um, and, and saw the symptoms and the impact on all the other services relying on that database. Um, we can collect, um, collect uh, Kubernetes incidents. So we actually do a lot of work with Kubernetes. Um, I, you know, so even this uh, demo environment that we've um, spun up using Litmus uh, uses Kubernetes at the back end. Um, and also, um, this comes from actually a real user um, of our system. We actually can find security incidents because if someone's trying to hack into your infrastructure, that probably is an anomalous event. Um, and we've actually caught that um, from the logs as well. So there's a whole range of use cases. Um, and, and, and so that's really what we do at the core. So really with Litmus, you know, you know, to kind of give you the background, why did we end up, you know, building a demo environment on Litmus? It was because my data were using Litmus um, to test even themselves. So they were early partners of ours uh, when we kind of uh, launched the first uh, private beta of, um, of Zebrium. Um, and and um, they, they wanted to basically test, um, they, 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 my data run some pretty large Kubernetes clusters running open EBS. And they wanted to basically see like, you know, can we catch real incidents that happen in their production environment? But rather than waiting for a real incident to happen in their environment, they basically ran the litmus test for open EPS. Um, I think there were about eight experiments at the time and we detected all of their ex um, experiments running unsupervised um, with the root cause. So we got a hundred percent hit rate with the correct root cause. And, um, and that was very exciting for us. And, and at the time we were actually discussing internally, how can we um, allow new users that want to try Zebrim and kind of give it a run without, you know, who may not be ready to put it on their own production environments and maybe wait a few days for a real incident to kind of occur. You know, how can we give them something that in a few hours they can kind of spit up, give it a try and see real incidents for themselves. And so we, we kind of, um, after a few discussions with my data, we kind of started partnering with them on the litmus um, care engine and kind of using that to build a demo environment, which is what I'm going to be showing you today. So um, I think Brian did a great job of kind of describing Litmus, so I won't go into too much detail, but we really um, uh, like it. Um, things that I really liked, um, especially that helps us with the demo, is you know, the declarative nature of it. So everything is basically um, configured, configured by YAML, which you deploy into your Kubernetes cluster. So that makes it really repeatable and easy to kind of, you know, just kind of have a bank of kind of configurations that you can kind of run um, your experiments um, repeatedly um, the same way every single time. Um, and also it doesn't require um, third party components. So uh, we looked at some other tools as well. And, um, and those tool, uh, some of those tools basically require you to set up a, a separate server that kind of coordinates all the chaos engines and stuff like that, which is extra infrastructure for you to manage. Um, with Litmus, you basically can deploy everything into your Kubernetes cluster and run it um, inside the cluster. So that was really cool. Um, and so, yeah, we basically built this um, um, uh, demo environment and you can actually find the whole GitHub repo here at the URL at the top. So this is something you can go in, you can clone, you can run. There'll be a blog coming out shortly after this with uh, more details on how you can run it. But um, it's basically a Python script, um, which has a few commands in it. So um, to basically spin up the entire cluster, um, takes about seven minutes just using the start commands here with the Google, um, it runs on Google Cloud. So you need a Google Cloud account and you need a Zebrim account. Um, but basically it will spin up a GK cluster on Google Cloud um, in the project that you uh, specify uh, with your Zebrim key passed in so that we can start sending data to your Zebrim account, which is a free account that you can get started with within a few minutes. Um, once it's deployed, what does it deploy? Well, you know, we had to put some stuff in there to kind of, you know, um, test the chaos against. Um, so one of the um, applications we have deployed is um, a kind of microservice e-commerce uh, dummy site called SockShop. Um, it basically has a whole bunch of MongoDB and MySQL and RabbitMQ and Go services and Java services that kind of um, build this kind of e-commerce site um, for, for kind of with, with the, the ability to search catalogs and, 
and do carts and checkouts and all those kind of things. Um, so that was um, pretty much our primary kind of microservice application that we deployed for kind of running chaos experiments against. Um, we deployed Kafka into another uh, namespace, and the reason we did that is because um, a lot of our kind of uh, users um, run Kafka, and it tends to be very problematic um, um, if, if you um, haven't configured things correctly. So it's, it's a great um, kind of service to kind of chaos test and, um, and get really good logs out of. Um, and, um, and the other one is basically just a random counter. It's a simple script that just basically creates a, um, uh, a random log stream with um, numbers, um, counters in it, uh, which we just developed to kind of show the kind of automatic pa passing capability of Zebrium. You can actually go in and graph those numbers um, very simply from the UI. So, um, um, so that's just there for kind of demos. Um, and then, of course, we deploy the Zebrium logs and metrics collectors, and then we have Google um, Kubernetes engine running underneath. So kind of once you've got that deployed in seven minutes, um, you can just use the list command to see what experiments you support. Um, and actually, if I just dive into um, the repo, um, the one there, let's see, so here, um, this is actually the GitHub repo that you can clone. If you want to add new experiments to this demo, you can just basically define them here so you can see all the different experiments we support. Um, and if you want to kind of look at what the managed PY um, script is doing, you can see all the code in here. So, um, so, so it's actually a very good reference as well for anyone um, who's actually getting started with Litmus. If you want to see how to define all these different experiments with the different variables, how to kind of run them you know, in an automated fashion, like all of that has been done here um, uh, for you to kind of reference. So going back to this, we have nine experiments that we, we have. So we basically deployed the generic experiments and Kafka experiments um, into the different uh, main spaces. And using the test command, you can either run a single test um, like this, or you can run them end to end. So that's basically running all nine tests with some delay between them so that we don't kind of have all these incidents grouped together into one incident. Um, um, and that takes about 3.6 hours to run end to end right now. But what you can see is when you run a test, you can see it kind of kicks off and there's, a, um, and we actually stream the logs in from the test as it's running in your environment. So you can see it in the, um, in the bash window as you're kind of running the test. Um, and then we show you the end results and then um, kind of summarize at the end. So, so it's a very easy way for you to kind of run litmus tests in your cluster, um, which create incidents in Zebra. And then finally, but not least, you can shut down the cluster at the end to assume the stop command. So everything's kind of there. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of run into, a, um, you know, um, kind of go into a demo of uh, Zebrium. So this is actually Zebrium. Um, this is like the overview page. Um, I actually ran the entire end-to-end -end, uh, test yesterday. So let's see what happened there. So um, you can see here what we actually did is we actually ingested over a four or five hour period when we ran the test about 1.7 gigabytes of logs, 10.7 million lines of uh, log lines um, coming from a free node cluster in our Kubernetes experiment. And we found pretty much all the, um, the incidents that you know, we're expecting to detect, and these are kind of noteworthy incidents, we call them. Um, what, what I kind of want to highlight here is this was all completely unsupervised, I can't stress that enough. And we managed to do that over 10.7 million lines of logs coming in. We found these nine incidents for each of the experiments with uh, the correct root cause. So that's, that's pretty, pretty powerful stuff, you know. And we do this with customers with way bigger uh, log events than this coming in every day. So, so you know, it's a very powerful um, kind of tool. So if I actually go into the instance um, that we created yesterday, uh, you can see a bunch of them here. Um, let me just go into this one here. This is actually quite a good one. So this is actually the pod delete experiment. I put a note up there. And actually you can see from the root cause, it actually found the, uh, the pod. So this is actually the pod uh, that Limus creates to run the experiment inside your cluster, um, which actually creates all the chaos. So that is actually technically the, the root cause of this um, incident. So we actually identified this is a root cause that caused the incident. So you can see it's picked a bunch of logs out of that uh, pod delete pod. Um, but if you kind of go down, you can see all the different services that were impacted. So the cart DB, so we actually deleted the cart DB, so obviously that's going to have an impact. Um, the cart service that re uh, relies on the cart DB um, obviously is going to be impacted because the cart service won't work without the database running behind it. We've deleted it, so um, so you expect some issues there. And we can also see there was a side impact, which I didn't expect, in the order service. So you can see kind of what the impact of that incident was from the symptoms. But what's really cool as well is we automatically pull out the hallmark events, as we call it. And so you can see here that we've highlighted what we think is probably the most significant event 
a user would probably want to kind of see to understand what's going on in um, all of those logs that we found. And, um, and you can see here very clearly the MongoDB from our cart service. If I expand the message, I can see it's a cart service. Um, basically, can't connect to MongoDB. So you'd expect that because we've deleted the cart DB, which is running MongoDB. And, um, and while it's basically respinning up um, a new pod um, to recover, um, there are going to be connection issues from the cart service. So you can see that at the end, we recovered, but we, we actually automatically detected all of this stuff. So that all happened again, completely unsupervised and, and, um, and essentially allows you, you know, and, and you can see in one screen, I basically got all the information I need to orientate myself to understand what's going on, what was the root cause and what was the actual critical error that, you know, may have impacted users. Um, the last example I'll show um, is basically, you know, we've just started supporting metrics. So here we've got the disk fill experiment. Again, it's running on the CartsDB pod. So we've basically gone and filled the disk um, on that pod up to 120% of the limits. Um, that basically causes the pod to kind of eject and, um, and be restarted. Um, again, we found the right root cause of the disk fill um, experiment runner was the root cause of all of this. And, and so we've kind of identified that correctly. Uh, but what's really cool is we also, in this case, because it's actually filling up um, disk space, it's generating um, the container file system metric has also been detected as an anomalous incident. So actually, if I click on that, you can see um, in, this, in this graph, um, when the experiment kicked off, um, you get an immediate spike as it fills up the pod with all the um, kind of junk data to kind of get it to 120% of its um, disk usage limits. Um, and then it stops because basically the pod is then killed off and then a new pod is, uh, is, is created. So that's exactly what we would expect, you know, in this experiment is, is to see that metric going up and, 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 and Zebram automatically found that um, as part of the incident. So you can see here, we've got some very powerful stuff that allows you to really kind of go in and do that all uh, completely uh, autonomously. Um, and just to kind of, you know, also highlight, you know, we do collect logs um, and we, you can search through them and you can see like uh, um, here, like you can still do all the stuff you'd expect from a log uh, collection tool, searching and filtering and all those kind of things if you need to dive deeper. But really this is the core of Zebrim. This is what is very unique and you won't find on any other tool right now. This ability to find instance unsupervised and kind of take you to the right uh, root cause um, with high accuracy. And, um, and that's what we've used litmus to kind of test. So that's really it for me, just to finish off, um, you know, we, we are currently in private beta, but we're kind of getting um, quite, uh, quite far along in that one at the moment. Um, so, but if you want to kind of uh, join the private beta, it takes about five minutes to set up, the accounts are free, you can spin up this demo environment in about seven minutes and start running it um, on it. Just leave it running on your laptop for four hours to kind of get the results that I just showed you there. And, um, and uh, we're really excited about it. We'd love you guys to try it out. So if you're interested, please sign up at this URL, zebram.com. And we look forward to working with you guys.